So thanks a lot, Chip. It's really great to be back here. This is kind of a different kind of talk than I usually give, and um, but I love uh, talking to the three CPG folks because I'm always on my toes with the questions that you're going to ask because I can never seem to anticipate them. Um, I'm, you know, of course interested in dog genetics and I come from an evolutionary biology background and that's kind of why I was studying dogs and it was only kind of recently I took this this interest in personalized genomics you know other than a personal interest you know I've had myself 23andMe, I've done Ancestry.com. Uh, and th this idea that we're not just looking at biological insights anymore, but we're actually trying to you know, return something to an individual and we're trying to help an individual with their life by looking at their genetic information and not trying to come up with a Bonferroni corrected significant p-value for something that you know, may tell us something about the etiology of a disease. And, uh, and so this you know, isn't why I got into dog genetics to begin with, but it's a really interesting you know, scientific question. And, and it, it encompasses lots of different scientific questions. So I think the most common reason you know, people think about personalized genomics is to look at prediction. So we, you know, an individual wants to know what is my risk of getting cancer, what is my risk of getting Alzheimer's, what is my risk of getting you know, blindness or something like that. And, um, and it's not an easy question. Just because you know loci that uh, impacted and you know the genotype of an individual doesn't mean you can necessarily make an accurate prediction for that individual or convey that prediction in a meaningful way to that individual. But another thing that I hadn't really appreciated until I started uh, thinking about this more was a lot of personalized genomics, like the reason why somebody is interested in their own genome is just explanatory. Like I already know that I'm left-handed, but I'm really interested to know why am I left-handed? You know, like what is the gene that I have that makes me left-handed and makes both of my parents right-handed or red hair or something like that? And, uh, and certainly in dog genetics, we see this a lot. We see my dog has epilepsy and I want to know why. Uh, and then beyond that, there's also the identity question. You know, who am I? Who are my relatives? Where did my ancestors come from? And so we have multiple different kinds of, you know, scientific questions that we want to uh, address with genetics. And, uh, and I think scientists should really focus on these kinds of questions because um, uh, the, it's a really vastly growing field. We've got four million births annually in the United States. And we've gotten to the point now where just Ancestry.com is doing over a million personalized geno genomes a year. So we're, so we're really starting to get, I would say, and I mean, this doesn't even count other companies, uh, clinical uh, personalized genomics kind of stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of genetic information being created today is being created in the realm of personalized genomics. And if you can figure out ways to mine that information, research is going to get accelerated from doing that. And you know, of course, with humans, we have, uh, uh, we have HIPAA regulations and data sharing can be a little bit difficult and all that sort of stuff. And uh, well, and the other thing is it's, it's actually a smaller market. So if you look at the number of dogs born in the United States every year, it's 7 million. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, you know, you kind of have this idea of going into personalized genomics with dogs. So to back up a little bit, you know, my interests in dogs are, are several fold. Um, you know, I think they're a great model for evolutionary biology. They're the first domesticated species. So you have sort of this interesting anthropological uh, issue with dogs, but then also, you know, what's artificial selection and what's natural selection, and how do you evolve all these adaptive phenotypes in such a short uh, period of time? They're the most phenotypically diverse mammal. Um, and, and you know, how does that happen genetically? How, what is the selection regime that goes through doing that? And how can you find the genetic basis of all these adaptations? And then in terms of disease mapping and whatnot, it's a great population. Purebred dogs um, you know, vastly facilitate uh, mapping of various phenotypes. And they're a great explanatory kind of resource. So you know, Darwin drew more pictures of dogs than finches when he did Origin of Species. Because if you want to explain evolution, talking about dogs is something that people you know, kind of get. And we have all these different now purebred dog populations that are being well characterized uh, and well studied. And the story of dogs is really the story of DNA. So this is going to be review, I think, for most of the people in the room. But for people who are interested uh, in you know, what does a dog DNA test do, it's kind of important to explain you know, exactly what's going on. And you can go from the structure of DNA, and it encodes the actual you know, proteins that are in there, uh, these, these base pairs that are laid out uh, throughout the double helix. And what geneticists do is they sort of um, have decoded what, you know, what this means. 
every individual, so this, you know, this is a DNA strand, it's got a forward and reverse strand, and every individual for every gene has two copies of the gene, one it's got from its mother, one it got from its father. And so if you want to look at the information that's encoded in here, you want to compare the similar strands from both copies of the DNA. And the question that we, the, the things that we want to look at as geneticists is where are there differences in the DNA between you know, what an individual inherited from the mother and the father, where are the heterozygous sites? Or where are the other individuals in the population, where do they have variation that might be different from an individual? And so very quickly after the structure of DNA was decoded, we figured out ways to sequence short sections of DNA, genes of interest, you figure out you know, what is the genetic basis of differences between certain individuals, uh, how do we compare to our you know, primate uh, uh, relatives, you know, so what are the differences uh, between humans and chimps, and we can direct if we know which gene to look for, how to do this with capillary Sanger sequencing and all that, um, but really in order to explain humans you have to be able to sequence a genome, and that was for the longest time a very, very uh, tall proposition, and so the Human Genome Project was a 13-year endeavor that cost $3 billion, and it sort of opened the way, uh, you know, it wasn't the first sequenced genome, I mean, we had smaller genomes that were sequenced from, from other organisms, but it really opened uh, the floodgates uh, to personalized genomics, and um, also the being able to do genomics in lots of other species of interest. So uh, four years after the Human Genome Project, the CHIMP sequencing consortium published Clint's genome at a cost of $50 million. Uh, shortly after that, the dog sequencing consortium uh, published the boxer Tasha's genome for $25 million. Uh, after that, Twilight, who was here at Cornell, I think Twilight's still in her Twilight years here at Cornell, uh, was sequenced for $15 million. And uh, Cinnamon the Cat, a uh, year after that, was sequenced for $10 million. And Leslie tells me that's not actually a picture of Cinnamon. That's Cinnamon's son, because by the time they finished sequencing Cinnamon, they decided that uh, it was too uh, overweight and old to be photogenic. And so they wanted to use the stand-in for the uh, genome papers. But. Anyway, I think we're going to allow that. So uh, the reference genomes got cheaper and cheaper, and, and this was um, you know, because the cost of sequencing got cheaper and cheaper. So genomics is being fueled right now by, uh, by you know, decrease in sequencing costs that has been far outpacing uh, Moore's Law to the point now where it's a penny per megabase for sequencing, which means we're within sight of a $1,000 genome. So once you have a reference genome, doing the resequencing is, is cheap and getting cheaper. And the reason why? is because, and again, as everybody in the room here knows, uh, we sequence genomes now in a way that probably seems like um, the most backwards way to do it, but it's the most, uh, it, it's the cheapest way to do it, and so therefore it's the best way to do it. Uh, and that's you take, a, you take a genome that you're interested in, and you replicate it as many times as you, as you care to, and then you break it up into a whole bunch of little pieces and then you take the reference genome and you try to glue those pieces back together and figure out where all the variants are. Now, this is, you know, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, but it's still a couple thousand dollars to do this. So if you're talking about companion animals and you're trying to do personal genomics, this is not the way uh, that you can do it in any sort of large scale. Like nobody's going to pay thousands of dollars. Uh, well, not nobody, but not many people are going to pay thousands of dollars to have a whole genome sequence uh, of their dog, and plus you have informatics costs and storage costs and all that kind of stuff. So if you're looking at personalized genomics, at least in companion animals for the near future, what you're doing is you're looking at genotyping arrays. And so you, you make the problem simpler and cheaper by instead of trying to sequence every single base pair, focusing on the base pairs that you know vary in the population. So we have, you know, over 300 resequenced dogs, you know, just on servers here at Cornell that we can look at and we can f see where all the variants are. And we can choose important variants well spaced throughout the genome and we can put them on genotyping chips. And so we can go along the genome and every 10 kilobases or something like that, put on a variant and identify um, for every single individual, what the genotype is at that variant. Is it homozygous for G? Is it homozygous for C? Is it heterozygous? And then we can tease apart which, so again, this is because there's two copies of, of that gene. We can tease apart, uh, you know, which one came from one parent and which one came from the other parent. And so we get these haplotypes that go along the chromosome. And you can think of the haplotypes as barcodes. 
So one parent gives this barcode in this region, and the other parent gives this barcode in this region. And if you have a database of barcodes that go region by region for all your different reference populations, then you have the ability to match barcodes to different reference populations along the genome. And so this is very different than the way DNA testing has been done in dogs, where it's been you know, treated as more or less a commodity. We want to use as few markers as possible to get uh, an insight into what the, um, uh, what the ancestry is of a dog. And, and when you do that, you don't have densely spaced markers. Instead, you have individual markers. And you're looking at allele frequency differences between breeds. And the problem is these SNPs are shared across many, many breeds. And they might be at different frequencies. And once you get hundreds of SNPs together, you can identify probabilistically, OK, it belongs to this breed, or it belongs to this breed, or it's intermediate between these two breeds. But the question gets very complicated very fast when you start looking at F2s and F3s. And the amount of information that's being encoded in this allele frequency um, data is rather limited. And in contrast, when you look at the, the haplotypes or the barcodes, you get this pattern where the barcodes aren't fixed within a breed. But if you have a long enough barcode, that barcode is going to be unique to the breed. So 35% of beagles carry this barcode and none of the other breeds carry that barcode, or 12% of the German Shepherds carry this barcode in this region, and none of the other breeds do. So if you see the barcode and it matches what you have for in some individuals in your reference panel, it almost always is individuals from the same breed, and then you can infer that that section of DNA was inherited from that breed. In fact, the only time it doesn't work is when you have a selective sweep that's shared across breeds because there's some sort of phenotype of interest. And so that's, and that's actually an interesting you know, case. And that's a small proportion of the genome. So it doesn't really affect your, your ancestry inference. Now, I, I've never tried this in humans. My intuition is it wouldn't work as well in humans. So again, dogs are nicer than humans to work with genetically. And I, and I think the reason for this is, um, is because of the breeding structure of dogs. So if you look at a, um, a purebred dog, they, they come with pedigrees. And you know these pedigrees, as we know, sometimes your father is also your grandfather. And we have sorts of issues that, that go on with that, with the pedigrees. Um, but, for, but for the purposes of inferring ancestry, what's interesting is every single pedigree from every single breed, if you had the information, and not every single breed has it, but if you, if you zoom out on that pedigree, they all kind of look the same. And they all look like a fish. So you have an individual, and it's got two parents, and it hopefully has four grandparents, but not always, and it hopefully has eight grandparents, but not usually. And you go back, and eventually you reach this pedigree collapse, and then you go back and you come up to this founder bottleneck kind of thing that's going on, or some other bottleneck that's happened in the breed. And so essentially, these are the sum total of all the haplotypes that are in the breed. So once you have a reference panel with enough individuals, and, and, and enough being you know, a two-digit number, not like a three- or four-digit number, then you essentially have all the haplotypes at any appreciable frequency in the breed, because they're all here. Like To a first approximation, you just don't have rare variants in most purebred dogs, because they're all descending from, from the same handful of individuals. And so you can use that um, to, to be able to identify these unique barcodes breed by breed uh, throughout the genome. And so this gives you a very different picture of the ancestry of dogs. Uh, so if you have this mixed breed dog, Coca, here, you could, you could run it on an allele-based method. And you can see that it's about one quarter Labrador, and it's about three quarters American Staffordshire Terrier, and then it's three quarters who knows what it is. Uh, that's the limit of the resolution. If you run it on a denser array, you can, you can actually paint across and see, well, yeah, it is Staffordshire Terrier, about 40%. It is Labrador Retriever, about 33%. But it's also got Golden Retriever, and it's also got Australian Cattle Dog. And you know, more or less, it kind of looks like that that's what it has. And so, so, so the method you know, actually works. And beyond that, because you've designed the array to put whatever markers you want to on it, and so this is what an AFI array looks like, although we now work with Illumina because it worked better for dogs five years ago, so we just keep using it. Um, you can put on markers that specifically investigate known inherited disorders. And you can put on markers that look at other parts of the genome. So particularly the Y and mitochondrial non-recombining regions are really informative for looking at maternal lines and paternal lines. Uh, you can look at relatedness as well between individuals whose parent offspring, whose first cousin, where does this information not match the pedigree? So we have some sort of misreporting. Uh, you can look at traits, so we know lots of uh, genetic basis for traits in dogs. And so this is something that can be uh, put on. And you can use it for research. 
So when we're doing GWAS studies, we use dense genotyping arrays to do it because this gives you the zip code of the causal variant um, you know, that's doing it if you have a well-powered study. And so if you're running dogs on a, on a dense array, you're not only getting better information about uh, ancestry and also comprehensive information about traits and disease, but you're also producing a database that can be mined and used to make new genetic discoveries uh, in dogs. And, and again, so a theme of today is how much nicer it is to work with dogs than with people. And, uh, and so if you look at traits in dogs and you look at traits in people, so this is human height here, uh, you know, you, if you have 10,000 people, you can start to get some marginally significant uh, p-values here at some height associated loci. If you look at 1,800 dogs from 158 breeds and you look at height, oops, you, you get many more significant loci with much greater p-values. So in dogs, you have loci of large effect that affect body size, which makes sense. I mean, there's, there's almost two orders of magnitude difference in size between a teacup chihuahua and a Great Dane. And you, you would never see you know, that size difference in people. I mean, we don't have, we don't have people the size of you know, people and elephants, right? So, uh, and so it has to be caused by some large effect allele. And so these are very easy to detect. Um, and when you detect them, what's nice is that a lot of times it, um, it informs back to similar biological processes in people. So it, it's been a running theme in the dog community where you can take a disease in dogs, so in this case, narcolepsy and Doberman pinchers. It was mapped, it was, it was a big study in cell. This is before we even had a dog genome. Uh, but, they, but they identified through linkage mapping where it was, they found a gene in there. Nobody knew that this gene was a neurotransmitter involved in sleep cycle regulation at all. But sure enough, the next year after it was published, they looked in humans and there were mutations there that were explaining narcolepsy. And now you've got gene therapy studies that are being done, all because it was able to be mapped in dogs first to help figure out uh, you know, what was going on. Deschain's muscular dystrophy is another great example. So it was spontaneously occurring in golden retrievers. In this case, in humans, we knew the genetic basis. It's the same gene in dogs that, is, uh, that has a mutation, different mutation, but same gene uh, in the golden retrievers. But what's interesting in this case, they were keeping a colony because it's such a good, um, so, so Penn was keeping a colony of these golden retrievers because it's such a good model for the human disease and you can test different therapies and all that. And they had one dog in their colony named Ringo, which tested positive when they did the gene test, but didn't seem to be affected with the phenotype, which they thought was weird. Maybe was there something in utero that happened with Ringo or, or something like that? They weren't quite sure what to do. Um, Ringo, as it turned out, was an escape artist. And so he escaped from his cage three different times and sired three different litters, uh, 52 pups in total. And one of them also tested DMD mutation positive, but didn't exhibit the phenotype. And so then they started to do some genomics and they discovered a compensatory mutation in a gene on a completely different chromosome. Nobody thought it had anything to do with it. And it's now suggested a new uh, you know, target for therapy. If we can upregulate this jagged gene, maybe we can help offset you know, many of the symptoms of the shame muscular dystrophy, not only in dogs, but also in people. And so disease after, you know, copper toxicosis, uh, blindness, uh, ichthyosis, uh, neural tube defects, you know, all of these things, mutations were found in dogs first, and then that led us to look at those genes in people and discover uh, new things. So they're a great translational model. Um, there's, there's lots of opportunities to, to improve the genomics of dogs. And so with this in mind, when I started out at Cornell, I sort of pitched the idea, like what we want to do is, you know, we want to start doing this kind of research in dogs. And, and fortunately for me, uh, Mike Kotlikoff was dean of the vet school. He was very gung-ho about this. He talked, um, uh, he helped pitch us to, to Zoetis, and we got a half million dollar grant from Zoetis as long, uh, along with some money from, from the uh, Cornell uh, advanced technology office uh, so that we could do genotyping. We, we essentially just took all the you know, dogs that looked interesting that were at the Cornell Biobank and now the Cornell Biobank has grown so much this is just a small minority of the samples that are there. But, we've, but we essentially did the largest GWAS study in dogs after customizing an array so that we could look at specific things that we wanted to, that we could fill in gaps that we wanted to, we could look at why, we could look at mitochondrial. And so this is this huge effort uh, from, with the Biobank, with, with you know, my lab, with other researchers uh, at, the, at the vet school here at Cornell and elsewhere. Uh, and, and long story short is it worked. So, you know, w when you look at this many dogs, uh, you find new associations for things that hadn't been mapped before. So we found this really interesting fur shedding locus that hadn't been detected before, which sort of interacts with this known Arspondin2 uh, gene and sort of 
helps uh, you know figure out whether you're going to be a high shedding or low shedding uh, you know individual dog or breed. Um, we found associations with clinical data that we had on these dogs. So, uh, so this is just one example here, alanine aminotransferase, which is important for diagnosing uh, liver uh, disorders. Uh, we found a genetic association with the gene that actually encodes the transferase here on chromosome uh, 13, and it drastically changes the expected value that you're going to, to see. So dogs that are homozygous uh, for the mutation have much lower values than dogs uh, that are wild type and heterozygous dogs are intermediate. And this is the expected reference interval range. And if we go outside of our GWAS study, we actually go into the biobank and we look at dogs that had been diagnosed uh, with liver uh, uh, disease. We see, in fact, this, this genotype is still associated with much lower values of ALT. Uh, in fact, many, many, many of these dogs are well within the reference interval range. And so we think lots of dogs might not be diagnosed with liver disease if, uh, if clinicians are relying on ALT to provide that diagnosis because with this genetic mutation, it just doesn't elevate as much uh, you know, as it would. So, so the reference intervals you use, it's going to be much more informative if you have a genetic basis for those intervals that's a personalized reference interval and not just sort of a standard uh, population-based one. And then speaking of populations and speaking of village dogs, what I thought was really neat. So, so uh, my brother and I had been sampling village dogs around the world, and this was a great opportunity to do a bunch of genotyping uh, in the dogs. And Laura Shannon from my group did a, did a bunch of analysis, and we could see patterns of diversity here in the dogs that really sort of honed in in Central Asia as being a center of diversity for these dogs and a likely uh, domestication origin, as well as working out sort of these interrelationships between all the different breeds that we, uh, that we see in modern dogs. And so you have this kind of adaptive radiation but you still have some breeds more related to other breeds and you've got crossing going on uh, between some breeds and gene flow. So it really was uh, uh, enlightening to see what the structure of dogs really looked like. And then also mapping out, uh, you know, what is the signature and the footprint of selection look like in the dog genome. And, and, and you know, using statistical genetic methods to detect selective sweeps that have occurred in certain dog breeds and then see, I mean, we see a lot of sweeps around body size, body shape genes, fur type and fur color genes, uh, the, the MHC region for the dogs. But then there's so many sweeps that we have not associated with the phenotype yet. And so I think this is you know, really interesting. Uh, obviously, we don't know the genetic basis of all the phenotypes in dogs. And so if we can figure out which sweeps go with which phenotypes, that would be really cool. And so we have this model that you have a cutting edge research chip that you can customize so it can deliver not only a high resolution ancestry profile, which is something that, that lots of people are interested in for their individual dog, but also comprehensive health and traits uh, you know, for that dog. And if you can combine this now with information from veterinarians and from owners, you, you actually have a new cutting edge research tool that can be used to help look at you know, the genetic and environmental influences for, for a whole host of things like aging, behavior, and cancer, where the sample sizes that you need to get high powered insights into these diseases are often well beyond the scope of, of even an NIH level grant. I mean, you're talking about you either need a major consortium or maybe even more than that in order to get this research off the ground. And so the problem is just recruiting individuals to take part in this research. And so we thought we had this really great idea now to, uh, to not only improve dog DNA testing, but also create something new that just hadn't been done before. So we went back to Zoetis. And they weren't exactly interested in that same vision. And we went back to, uh, I don't know how many CTL looked at, but I know I was involved in pitching to like six different companies, and it just wasn't in anybody's wheelhouse. It was kind of, it was a little bit too out there. It wasn't like central to the mission of any single company. And it was, you know, sort of a frustration as a PI here at Cornell. It's like, why won't anybody do this? It's so obvious that this is what should be done. This is how we're going to, this is how we're going to figure out cancer in dogs. This is how we're going to figure out obesity in dogs and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in, in the fact that there's people that come up to me, they, they want to enroll their dog in research at Cornell, and then they want us to tell them about their dog. It's like, and could you tell me what you know, breeds are in my dog and stuff like that? And to have to constantly say, well, I'm not really set up to kind of like deliver personalized results to everybody that takes part in a study at Cornell. You know, like that's not what my lab does. Sure, we'll try to do what we can, but you know, once you start having thousands of dogs in your study, uh, it's really beyond the scope of any grad student to try to <laughs> give personalized attention to every single one of those people. 
And so this is something that you know we had tried to push forward in in, in different channels. And, and as it turned out, my brother who had been doing a lot of the village dog sampling was finishing up his his PhD at Yale. And last year, you know, said to me, "Well, Adam, I'm finishing up my PhD, and the more I've been thinking about it, um, you know, the more I realize that I don't know." any academics who have a life that I would envy. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me? <laughs> He's like, it's not about you, it's about me. And um, I, so I, I, I kind of want to look outside of academia to see what you know, the opportunities are for, for doing research and, and, and doing stuff. And you know, we talked about uh, NGOs, and we talked about you know, private industry and all that kind of stuff. And then you know, at some point, the, the dog thing came up. And we're like, well, yeah, you know, like, this whole idea, I mean, what would it be? Would it be like 23andMe for dogs, or would it be like, you know, this? And, and so we were sort of batting around ideas of about whether or not it made sense to try to see what it would take to bring that idea to, to fruition. And, and so something to know about Ryan is he was class of 2005 at Harvard in computer science. And um, so he's not known for jumping into new ventures lightly, so his classmate, uh, Mark started with him. They were actually in the same computer science class together. They were actually on the same project team. And, um, and, and so they, they worked a little bit together, but eventually Ryan said, Mark, MySpace already exists. If you don't stop with, with this, the Facebook thing and get your project done, you're going to flunk, flunk the class. <laughs> And so he now admits that that was a mistake. He should have probably approached that opportunity differently. But <laughs> another one of his classmates, so after Ryan graduated, uh, uh, he did some, some work in private industry. And then he was looking at going into, uh, into grad school. And when he was looking at going into grad school, another one of his Har uh, Harvard classmates approached him, Matt, and said, you know, I'm starting a company. Uh, we're going to deliver ingredients and meals to people that they can cook in their own home. Uh, it'll be really great. Uh, you know, it'll be a su subscription kind of thing. It'll be healthy eating, you know, stuff you can do with your significant other. And Ryan's like, Matt, I know you're a great business guy. I know your business is going to be successful. But like, really, like the people still have to cook the food. Like, How many people are really going to be interested in this? And so he turned down being one of the first few employees at Blue Apron, which is now a company valued at more than $2 billion. So he's turned down two opportunities. And so we had to kind of like think through, like, what is the business model here that we'd be able to do? And we eventually you know, did settle on, on, on a business plan um, that, that we think could be successful. And, and the great thing about trying to come up with a good startup plan uh, is if, you, if you're in an area which is not fully tapped, which certainly would be dog genetics, most dogs don't get genetic tests done, uh, it's not a huge field, it's not as big and, uh, as you know, human genetic testing is. So you have an opportunity to, to bring something to that field where you can be highly competitive and, uh, and, and you can make a profit. You could, you could build a product that you can start selling and getting cash flow relatively soon, but that puts you in a position where you can then pivot into larger sorts of fields. And that's the kind of thing that really interests uh, you know, lots of people to join in to, to a sort of uh, startup. And so we were pretty successful at raising money from, from both venture capital and angel investors and in getting started um, and getting a great scientific advisory team and, and, and business advisory team uh, together. And so then, so last year uh, we started Embark. And so uh, the idea, uh, you know, behind what we wanted to do was, you know, we wanted to bring uh, cutting edge science uh, into dog genetics, and so we, we kind of you know so this is our this is our logo which we went back and forth on, but we wanted something that kind of said dog instead science, but also said you know we're approachable and fun kind of thing. So we don't want to be like Gattaca for dogs, but we actually <laughs> we want people to like f understand their dog. Like and it's not like dumbing it down for people, but it's actually taking the time to explain it at a you know like at a level that's that's understandable. And, and that's something that's important to do, and, and researchers don't always do that naturally. Um, so yeah, so the, so the scientific vision, you know, in the short term, obviously there are uh, over 200 known genetic defects in dogs. And these are things that, you know, the vast majority of them are things that you can test for with the Illumina uh, technology. Um, and you can, and so with a dense, you know, with a dense marker chip, you can include those sorts of things. You can include traits on it. You can do comprehensive screening of those and uh, highly accurate uh, breed, breed mixture analysis. And if you can get information from owners and vets, 
then this, this database, which is going to be larger than any other canine genetic database, uh, can be used to actually accelerate new discoveries and help map more difficult diseases in dogs that actually have a high uh, disease burden. You know, lots of dogs get heritable disorders, and most of the heritable disorders they get are things like cancer and hip dysplasia that we don't know the genetic basis for well enough to breed away from. So it's a real, it's a, you know, it's a real issue. It's a real opportunity. Um, we had, uh, you know, we, we worked with the Cornell uh, Tech Transfer Office. Phil O did a great job shepherding this through. This is not like sort of a common, uh, you know, traditional uh, licensing agreement. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, you know, the, in terms of intellectual property and stuff, it's, you know, it's a very shifting field. And so it took a lot of uh, legwork to get that done. Uh, we got um, inaugurated into the McGovern Center for Life Sciences uh, Development just up there in Weill Hall. So we have a bioinformatics core that is based there with most of the company uh, being based in Austin, Texas, uh, because it's a little bit easier to, for most people to get to Austin than it is to Ithaca. So for like designers and marketing and, and all that kind of stuff uh, uh, based there. And, and within the first year of, of being company, we actually got to the point where we could um, uh, where we could start marketing a genetic test. And you know, we have a box. We have a licensing agreement with Cornell. We're research uh, partners, and so we try to work with Cornell uh, to 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 have a win-win situation where we're actually uh, you know furthering the research that that can be done with dogs. So the chip itself uh, is is actually Cornell designed for uh, genetic mapping and then Embark designed custom content uh, that can go on top of it. So it's the, it's the most powerful genetic association chip that can be used in dogs. And then on top of that, there's thousands of markers that are in there. And, and it's not just assaying like health and traits that get returned uh, to owners you know, right away when they do it. There's lots of, of interesting content that's in there. So you know, one thing uh, that, that some of the human uh, personalized genetic companies do is they give you your Neanderthal percentage, right? And that's one of the like most shared things that, that customers do. And, uh, and, and we thought about it a bit, and we're like, well, we could deliver a wolfiness score. And, and the question is, well, how do you deliver a wolfiness score? And uh, you, know, you could say, well, you know, some dogs are dog-wolf hybrids. And we certainly do have customers that gave us dogs that were dog-wolf hybrids, which was kind of interesting. But that's not what the wolfiness score is. What the wolfiness score is is actually a scientific Project. So we know that there are dozens of regions in the dog genome that are called candidate domestication regions. So there's lots of variation in those regions in wolves. There's hardly any variation in dogs. And it looks like there's, there's certain markers in those regions that are fixed or almost fixed in dogs and are, and are absent or segregating in wolves. And so we don't know what they do, though, because like, there's dozens of them. And dogs and wolves differ in many different phenotypes. And I don't know anybody that's brave enough to do the uh, back cross dog wolf design and phenotyping to figure out you know, which linkage interval goes with which phenotype. But, but the fact is, you can, you can look at all of these intervals, and you can put markers on your chip. And so we have over 1,000 markers now that are across these regions or are otherwise highly differentiated between dogs and wolves. And lo and behold, you get lots of dogs that have some wolfiness to them, like 1% or 2%. And so if we can start to associate the particular wolfy alleles that these dogs have with any sort of behavioral or morphological or whatever tendency, we can actually start to dig back and figure out What's being selected for? Was this at domestication? Is this something else? You know, what's going on? What makes a dog a dog? So I think you know that's kind of fun, but it's also a fun way to engage customers. And and most people also share their wolfiness score for their dogs, so people are having having fun with that. Um, so yeah, so we do uh, DNA extraction and genotyping at a CLIA certified uh, facility. We get really high call rates, so, so the uh, Luna chip works quite well. Uh, we're retailing the test for, for $199, and we have special pricing for breeders, uh, veterinarians, and researchers. And we have varying levels for researchers. So some researchers are interested in having us actually just, you know, they give us the list of people that they want to take part in the study, and we can just mail out swabs to those people, and then we just engage them like regular customers. Uh, and other researchers just want to use us as a genotyping service. They've already extracted DNA, and, you know, in that case, they just want to run it on our chip. And so, so there's varying levels of research support that we offer. Uh, but of course, it's more than you know just a chip. That you have to be able to communicate the results to the customer in 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 a useful way. And so we spent a lot of time. We had really good designers that would help kind of make approachable you know this daunting list of 160 or more you know horrible disorders that your dog may or may not have. And how do you go through and you browse that list? Um, we're about to release what we call these modules, where you can go through and you can answer questions about your dog. And so this is of course 
useful for doing mapping. So we can say, oh, these are, these are alleles that are correlated with dogs that are reported to be obese. But it's also useful for the owner because they can think about obesity in their dog. They can think about nutrition and diet in their dog. And they can get resources to maybe help them uh, if, they, if they need help in those regards. All the dogs get a vet report. So this is one of the other things that we try to design through. So it says, this is my dog at home, by the way, Penny. And so this is her, uh, this is her breed mix. We have a predicted weight. We have a genetic age. So dogs age at different rates, depending on how big they are and other factors. So we try to translate. So if you know your, the calendar age of your dog, we can predict kind of what the human equivalent years are uh, in your dog. And then if your dog's at risk for, for any sort of disorders that can pop up, and so the vet can see it you know, right away. And we have many people emailing their vets their, their vet reports, and we get calls from veterinarians that want to now have the product in their vet office and, and all that kind of stuff. And, the, um, and, and you know, people are interested in dogs. So we've gotten lots of, um, of interest from, from different media outlets. And so we were fortunate enough to be on the Today Show the day that we launched. Uh, the product we got a lots of uh, interest from there uh, and and our our facebook page started to get filled up uh, with some people that were very happy that we were offering this sort of thing but then we also had uh, people that were not happy that we were offering this and they fell into two distinct camps uh, one of them was why would i pay 199 dollars if i can get a dna test for 75 dollars on amazon and then the other camp saying everybody knows that dog dna tests are crap <laughs> i'm like well <laughs> maybe so <laughs> we had so so fortunately once we started to get um, customers actually taking the test we start to get feedback and we, we actually you know it, it was amazing how strongly negative some people thought dog DNA testing was in that you know nobody is returning the real results like I know what breeds are in my dog and every time I turn it into a company I get a different answer and it's never the right answer but then you know like I gave you offered me a free test because I'm a veterinarian, so I decided I had nothing to lose, and then I took it, and then sure enough, it was 100% accurate. Like I knew, I saw the, you know, the mother was a miniature schnauzer, the father was a miniature poodle, and that's exactly what you said with your test. Finally, I have something you know, that I can recommend. Uh, most people didn't know the ancestry of their dog ahead of time, but they were still uh, you know, quite happy uh, with their results and were uh, well res uh, reviewed on Amazon, which has been an important uh, sales channel as well. So there's a whole bunch of different things for um, customer psychology and, and all that kind of stuff for, for how you deliver results in a way that are, is scientifically accurate and the customer you know, is getting their money's worth in understanding what's going on. So uh, what are some of the future steps that we're, that we're looking to do? Um, obviously, we want to expand our test offerings. So there's more diseases that we have on the chip that we're undergoing validation now. We're hoping to start to return those to owners and breeders uh, very shortly and expanding our offering of traits uh, that we're disclosing as well. Um, we're looking to recruit 10,000 dogs so that we can uh, have a well-powered enough study to do genetic mapping of behavior. We think that once we get 100,000 dogs, we're going to have well enough um, uh, large well enough powered study that we can start to look at some of these complicated uh, disorders that actually have a, a really big you know, loss of life in certain breeds. And ultimately, we would love to be at the place where we have a million dogs that are, that are, that are not only genetically analyzed, but are taking part uh, you know, regularly. And it can serve as sort of a sentinel in the environment for human health and aging. You know, we have, you know, with a million dogs, you can have a thousand dogs at once that have a certain cancer. And if those dogs are clustered spatially or have some other environmental thing that's associated with it, that's really important information to know. Or if there's a, a human clinical, or if there's a clinical trial they want to do and it's too expensive to do in people, maybe they want to do it in dogs first, you can recruit enough cases that you can actually do that clinical trial. So, so the, the amount of difference you can make depends strongly on the number of customers you can have and you can keep coming back and, and interacting with the website. And so coming up with ways uh, you know, to do that is, is what our goal is. Because we think we, we, what we want to do is use genetic knowledge to actually not only help with the breeding of the dogs and help with the diagnosis and the therapy of the dogs to get healthier dogs, but also drive translational uh, research in people that can, that can further the aim of healthy people. So obviously, you know, this has been a huge collaborative effort. Uh, you know, my lab has, has laid a ton of the groundwork for this. The, the biobank and collaborators, uh, both at the vet school and elsewhere at Cornell and elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, the Village Dog Project, of course, was a ton of people. Um, so, you know, I 
can't possibly thank everybody enough. Uh, and now to have a new group of, of uh, collaborators uh, here at Embark and, and growing. So I definitely encourage everybody to check us out at EmbarkVet.com. And uh, I talked to everybody, if you, uh, so we got it set up now. If you have a cornell.edu address and you're interested in doing Embark uh, for your dog, you can get $50 off if you use the coupon code Cornell2016. I, I'm not the guru who sets all of this up. We have like website gurus that like maintain all of this kind of stuff. So if you're, if you're interested in trying us out, uh, you know, let us know. Or you can look at example results uh, online and stuff like that. So thanks. We have time for questions. Yep. I, I sort of have yeah, a yeah. question for you, Adam. Okay. Uh, this chip, is it exclusively SNPs or can you cap capture any structural variation? Uh, we capture, so we capture indels directly. Structural variants, uh, if you have the specific breakpoints, you can capture them directly. Uh, what we're working on validating right now, and what we have built in, is for larger structural variants, you can put a bunch of different probes there and detect if there's a deletion or a duplication. Although that's not exactly what they're designed for, but there's been a lot of research in that area, and we think we're getting close enough um, that we'll have a high enough validity of that test to be able to offer it. But that's not something that we offer right now today. And so what's the current chip in terms of SNPs versus Indels? Or... It's... Uh, I would say it's, 90, it's roughly 99% SNP and 1% Indel, because we just we had a preference for SNPs when we were choosing the markers that we were that we were putting on it, uh, and then and then a, a smaller proportion for I mean, any marker can be a marker for a CNV. Like you can de novo detect CNVs if they're big enough and you have the right you know software infrastructure, and we're working on validating that so we can do that. But in terms of like assaying a specific CNV, it's a small, it's less than 0.1%, but that's still, you know, a thousand markers that are just specific for copy number variation. And the reason I asked is because I asked you a question in a seminar a while ago about when you actually do the quantitative trait mapping in dogs, often it's not SNPs that are right. causal. And it's not coding SNPs that are causal a lot of times. Sometimes it's regulatory, right? And you said that, you know, upward of 30% can be in dogs or yep. Right, so the estimate now is about 20% structural variation is the causal variant now that you know suffers from lots of different biases. So the true answer could be 10%, the true answer could be 30%. We don't know. Uh, in terms of doing association kinds of mapping, if you have a dense enough chip, and particularly, so we've been working a lot in my lab for doing imputation. Um, not having the causal variants not quite as important because you have a good enough tagging variant that you can still detect the association. You can still give a prediction. Uh, it would be better, yeah. So it would be better to directly assay, and we and so we try to do that with all the known ones that we have. But uh, you you definitely can work around that problem and still do good science without knowing a priori that it's a structural variant. Yep. How many dogs did you need to set up the chip originally for Embark? Yeah, so, um, so what we did there was we have a database of 295 whole genome sequence dogs. And so that's what my lab worked on to do this genetic association mapping array. So we're, we're focused on filling in the gaps in the existing array. And then for the Embark chip, it's just mining all of the scientific literature to find anything that's been associated with anything that has scientific validity and then putting that on the array. So for the For the an no, so for the ancestry, that's what so the Zoetis project, so we're, we're, right? So we looked at you know, yeah, five thousand dogs, and, and so we took specific variants um, from the sequence village dogs. Actually, we put them on there. We identified haplotypes, and then it's sort of an iterative process now where you take new whole genome sequence dogs and see if any of them have variants that would distinguish between haplotypes that are currently collapsed with the existing markers, and then you add those markers onto the array kind of thing. We're, we're not opposed to, to doing this iterative improvement sort of thing. Right now, it, it does seem to be uh, good enough. But, but yeah, we, we have lots of different projects going on. And as new stuff is discovered, it would be great to you know, get, it, get it out there, and, and you know, not only in the scientific literature, but also back to customers so that they can get better insights as well. 
you stay in touch with <clears throat> you stay in touch with the owners at all to see if they're you know any of those individuals develop yeah. diseases later in life? Yeah, absolutely. So ninety five percent of the people opt in to take part in genetic research surveys and studies and stuff. And we send out regular emails and as we add more content to the website they can come through and they can uh, you know, it's lots of times it's filling out questionnaire kind of data, uh, but we hope to get to the point where it can be, you know, even more involved stuff for certain targeted studies. And so that's that's absolutely something that we want to that we want to expand. Let me ask a quick question. Um, I mean, that is um, so. One of the one of the powers of uh, I mean, you meant talked about the breed structure that generates the haplotypes. Um, in dogs, but then the village dog project you didn't really talk about no. the, the advantage of you know sort of why that's a powerful adjunct tool and how many of these dogs, which like your dog and many dogs, are really products of you know they come from a you know, pound or something right. like that, and they have this mix. You know, there's there's actually a spectrum that you didn't touch on. Of, of yeah, I mean, so most of the dogs in the world are not purebred dogs, and they're not even like mixed breed dogs. They're just sort of like village dogs that just kind of like live around in the villages, and they've. There's been populations of village dogs well before we've had purebred dog breeding. Uh, and so we, and I, I didn't put it on here, but I mean, we've had some people send us village dogs. And of course, they don't tell us it's a village dog, but we're like, oh, okay, well, this is a dog that looks like an Indian village dog. And it most closely matches dogs that we found in Delhi, because we happened to go, you know, Delhi was one of the six places in India that we sampled. And then you return that result, and the other's like, oh my god, I picked up this dog from the streets of Delhi. And you were, were able to get it exactly right. I'm like, well, you know, we kind of lucked out, because we just happened that be one of the cities that we went to, but yeah, okay, that's great. And then, you know, other times we'll say, oh, this, you know, this is an East Asian village dog, it, you know, say it comes from East Asia, and, and, and the person will write back, oh, I was really disappointed because I wanted to know what breeds were in my dog. I mean, I adopted my dog from the streets of Taiwan, and I wanted to know what breed, I'm like, there are no breeds in your dog. It's, an, it's a village dog. Like, it's, <laughs> that's what it is. And so, so you, there is some, you know, education uh, to make people feel good about the results they get, because we don't want to, like, Say it's a mixed breed dog just because that's what the person wants to hear. We want to kind of like educate. Yes, it. What, what I was what I was um, trying to uh, get to is the is the, the linking of genetic variants to sort of new diseases. I mean, one of the powers of the of the you know the, the breeds is that it's basically sort of these giant linkage sequence right. haplotypes. So you can link you can quickly with a few markers find things that are associated, but right. you can't find the actual causal SNP. Right. Whereas the L the, the Gene region that broken down a lot more in the village dogs is is that an integral part of the the sort of going forward? Yeah, so that's why we want to use a dense array. That's why we want to do things like imputation. Is because now we've got a heterogeneous population, and so you're so you don't get the big linkage interval. You get a much smaller right. linkage interval. And and I mean we've got like Jess in my lab can show you GWAS plots where it's it's not a skyscraper, it's a dot in the air, and if we just didn't have that marker on the chip, you wouldn't have detected it because you're using a heterogeneous population. But now you know what gene it is. So, so it's kind of great. And, and you know, there's, there's pros and cons to both, and I think working together is good, where you get an initial association within a breed that you can then go through when you have a big database of dogs like this, particularly owners that are involved in the website. You can push out a question, you can get the response back, and you can quickly see whether the genetics in this genetically heterogeneous population validate the initial association that you saw in a breed.